Hi everybody, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Fun with Physics, where today we'll look at the torque curve of a modern F1 engine. And this is brought to you in collaboration with Risa Studios. I'm part of the team at Risa. We uh, are, as you probably are, are aware, working on the Automobilista racing simulator. And one of the newest cars we're making is a single-seater inspired by the modern F1 uh, rules, regulations and, and performance. And that's why I'm looking at the specs of F1 and trying to interpret them so we can have sort of a reasonable approximate in our in our uh, simulation. Um, that's why uh, we're doing this. So today, trying to look uh, at the shape of the curve, the torque curve of a modern F1 engine. Can we do that? We'll see. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> Obviously, am I being delusional? We don't have a lot of information, so yes. So you could say, well, he's delusional, he cannot come up with a reasonable answer to the question. Uh, you can go watch something else. But then again, this hasn't stopped me from trying before, has it? So we'll just go ahead, even though we have to realize that this is all with a, a pinch of salt, perhaps a bit more than a pinch, and we can just see how far we can uh, we can get. Uh, continuing the disclaimer uh, part, we just don't know a lot, right? I'm not an expert on internal combustion engines, and you can try to ring the F1 teams uh, and the engine department and ask them for all the information and, and the data, and you can be sure as hell they won't give it to you. They probably hang up the phone laughing. Uh, some might even sort of be brought to hospital from uh, dangerous choking from laughter conditions. So we don't know a lot, and if you take uh, the things that remain about those things, probably we don't know a lot either, and if there are any parts left over, well, we just don't know. However, let's focus on the things that we do know. Fuel and air comes together in an engine, and then we get a black box, the yada yada yada, and then we get power. It's really that simple, just the, the, the power of oversimplification, right? Always works. But Okay, we do know a bit more. The fuel flow is regulated quite strictly by the regulations. That's what the regulations tend to do. So we get a certain equation here uh, where the fuel is also capped at no more than 100 kilos per hour. You can go to a spreadsheet software uh, package, which we'll do later. Uh, you get this curve with RPM here and fuel flow kilos per hour on this axis. So you see that the fuel flow increases until 10 and a half uh, K RPM. And then we get a consistent fuel flow of 100 kilos per hour. This is very important information because the fuel dictates the maximum power you can make, the fuel that's burned in, in the engine. Fuel and air are, are combined, but they need to be combined in a certain ratio. And you can push more air in an engine, but you also need to proportionally increase the amount of fuel. So the fuel is very, very sort of a limiting thing in how much power your engine will make. So this is actually quite important and will be very helpful. Then on to the black box, the yada yada, we don't know anything about box. We do know that fuel contains a certain amount of uh, energy and we mix it with the air and we burn it into the engine and that doesn't happen at 100% efficiency. A lot of heat will be produced and only a part of the energy that's contained into the, f into the fuel will actually be turned into uh, power. But uh, we do know, somewhat know, what sort of energy density you get in fuel. And this is subject to some interpretation. And it's also, uh, well, despite the fact that arguably they use pump fuel in F1, they don't. So who knows? But we do know that this, let's say for the argument, uh, for the sake of argument here, that's 45 megajoules of energy stuck in one kilo of fuel. We don't like this uh, unit of hour for, for, for consumption, so we translate that to the fuel flow per second. Doing the simple sum here, we get this amount of fuel, 0 0.02778 kilos per second, that's flowing uh, into our engine. Then, if we know how much uh, energy is contained in one uh, kilo of fuel, and we know how much, at which rate we are consuming it, we can multiply those two together and we get 1.25 megajoule per second uh, worth of energy in, uh, in, in the engine. Joule per second is just another way of uh, describing a one watt of, of power. 
and one horsepower is 746 watts. So that gives us the ability to uh, do another little bit of simple math, dividing the 1.25 million by that 746, giving us a theoretical horsepower figure of 1676, which is a lot. Uh, that's, uh, I guess, we're done with this video a lot sooner than I uh, than I thought. Sorry about that. 1676 horsepower. That'll do. Thank you for watching. Uh, or stick around and we'll uh, get into a bit more detail because this is nonsense if only if only engines just are not efficient I mentioned before they turn a lot of uh, energy into heat while burning uh, the fuel and air together so Mercedes early 2016 so this is quite a long time ago they mentioned that they are more than 45 percent efficient and if the ERS the, the battery wizardy electronics are running at full tilt we get bleh, more than 50% efficiency. However, uh, the efficiency is not the same for each RPM. I don't think that's possible. Even Mercedes uh, won't make that happen. And these are some curves that I found on the all from already famous internet with the efficiency here, for example, being about 28% in this case at a low RPM, rising to 34-ish percent at a medium RPM and then dropping again. Same for this diesel, ah, clicking mouse button accidentally, should not become a sniper. Uh, anyway, diesel engines are more efficient, uh, but they also have this, this curve. So this made me think, well, we have the fuel flow with RPM, that's important. We know the density of the fuel, or at least we have a ballpark figure and we can play with that. And we can create one of those thermal efficiency curves as we see here. And then we have enough puzzle pieces to uh, construct a torque curve, meaning that it's spreadsheet time! Woohoo! I'll tap, 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 I'll tap. There we are! Spreadsheet. So in this spreadsheet, behind all these charts which are currently showing nothing, uh, the math is, uh, is present. Trust me on that one. What we have here is the energy density for two engines, the thermal efficiency, the peak, at which RPM this thermal efficiency is reached, and then we have a certain drop-off in efficiency, so we create one of those efficiency curves, and we have some shape variable that ch changes the shape of the efficiency curve. So let's just go ahead and make two engines, the worst case and the best case. Uh, I've read on the internet, <laughs> don't we all, that there might be a chance that the fuel energy density by uh, in the fuel used by F1 teams might be up to about 50 megajoules per kilo. Uh, I don't know. A uh, less optimistic case would be 45 megajoules per kilo. If you've got any sort of more clear source of, uh, of data for this, let me uh, know, absolutely. We've also seen that they are more than 45% efficient and more than 50% efficient when all the extra battery stuff goes on. So it's certainly 45% and not 50% by the pure internal combustion engine, but we're 2017 now, let's go with the most optimistic case of 50% thermal efficiency. I don't know what they're reaching today, might be optimistic, but that's the idea. Here's another thing though, this thermal efficiency uh, is reached at a certain RPM and beyond that there should be some drop-off. Now currently I don't have any drop-off so you see the thermal efficiency is a straight line, a low RPM and a high RPM. That's not going to be likely so we will have some drop-off. So now the worst case engine has a efficiency of 45% here at 10 and a half thousand RPM dropping off when the RPM rise and dropping off when the RPM lowers to quite a very low uh, value here of just like 17% at 5000 RPM. Is this excessive for drop off? I have absolutely no idea, but I'm going to assume that uh, that it is. So in the best case, engine will use less drop off, which might be too optimistic, but that's the whole idea of uh, the best case scenario. So we get like an extreme. Uh, and a window within it might not be super unlikely that modern F1 engines might perform. That's sort of the the deal here. Why do we choose uh, 10,500 RPM for the peak efficiency? I don't know. 
going on? Uh, no, I don't know really, because the fuel flow dictates where you have the most power. So you'd say if you want the most power, you want to stay above 10,500 RPM, because that's where you've got the most fuel flow, and the more fuel you have, the more power you can make. So it would make sense to tune this optimum efficiency for a higher RPM, so that in the power band where you are after uh, shifting up, so you shift up at, I don't know, 13,000 and you would drop down to 10.5. That makes sense from an optimal power point of view, but they have such a limit in what they can consume for a race uh, that perhaps you want to be a little bit, you know, at about 9,000 RPM or it, it doesn't pay back to be at these high RPMs because there will be more friction and other losses possibly might increase at these high RPMs. So that's a very sort of sketchy poor argument I'm making here, but I'm assuming uh, that, uh, that the optimum efficiency is tuned at around 10,500 RPM. We can change this a little bit and see what happens, but for now let's, uh, let's look at that. So a lot of talking uh, later and we've got two curves here then, looking at different efficiency curves, a known fuel flow, we get the most optimistic case possibly 931 horsepower at 10,500 RPM, purely from the internal combustion engine. Uh, the, the more pessimistic case shows about 754 horsepower at 10,500 RPM. So that's quite a, a gap and who knows, this is some a window in between here could very well be what a modern F1 internal combustion engine operates at without any of the battery uh, stuff. What does it mean for uh, for torque? Well, torque and power are related. Effectively, torque times RPM is power. If you use the proper units of uh, speed and uh, power, you that works. Need some conversion for horsepower and, and RPM because we don't like re uh, revolutions per minute is not proper physics. Boo. Anyway, torque. Most optimum case then, we got a pretty flat torque curve with over 500 newton meters, even at a very low RPM, rising up to about 630 newton meters uh, at, at the peak. So that's the most optimistic case. And the more pessimistic case, wi where we had 750 horsepower, we get about 511 newton meters of torque. And the fuel flow uh, restricts the power, so that's why the point where the fuel flow is maximizing, we don't get any telephone calls. Sorry about that. Um, that's why it drops. And if we tune this value, so now we have this pessimistic engine, let's take the pessimistic engine and set the optimum RPM at 11500. And you see it's optimum is tuned here at a higher RPM and this drop off is not occurring. Tuning it for a lower RPM, 10,000 for example, we get a more pronounced drop off but we get more power at the lower RPM. So that's sort of a visualization of this uh, efficiency curve, how that affects uh, the power. So there you have it, um, with plenty of uh, salt grains of salt, buckets of salt, a sort of a window where we might have performance of our modern F1 engine, the torque and power levels. In uh, a next video, uh, I'll try to add the, the curse system to this. And then there will also be another video where we try to deploy this uh, electric energy over a lap and see how that works with uh, where it is best to deploy the, the extra battery power for acceleration or top speed. We'll do some simulation and then things will get pretty complex then. But the basis of that will be the pure internal combustion engine power, which we've now established-ish, hopefully. I uh, hope you found it interesting. Of course, this is all uh, with a pinch of salt and uh, sort of an, a window between which the true engines might perform. Comments are welcome as, as usual and uh, thank you for watching. And well, I better go into the simulator and drive this uh, virtual rendition of the uh, interpretation of the modern F1 car. Ha! Could have a worse job. I could. Not complaining. Bye bye, guys.